Hey, this is Michael Carter, lead pastor here at The Life Church, and I just want to thank you for watching this rebroadcast of this week's message. We hope it's in some way an inspiration to you and that there will be things that you can apply to your own life to help you along your journey. I'm really glad that you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus, and I believe the Word of God will help you do just that. So be encouraged, and if there's something in the message that helps you or rings true with you, we'd like you to respond. You can leave a question or a comment or even a prayer request in the comments below. I'm praying for you, and I hope you have an amazing week. This morning, I'm just going to ask you, be patient with me. Um, I, I, won't, I won't keep you real, real long, but... Um, be patient uh, as the Lord takes us on a little journey. Um, turn, if you have your Bible or if you have a way to get to Scripture on your phone or your iPad or your Kindle or your Apple Watch or your Fitbit or maybe you just got a way to remember all the Scripture, you memorize it all, you know. Uh, turn it in your Bible to Mark chapter 4. We'll get over there in just a few minutes. We'll get over there in just a few minutes. This passage, God gave me this passage this, this week. Um, and, you know, usually in Mark chapter 4, uh, we're going to be down around verse 35. We're going we're to look at the passage where he calms the storm. And most of us, I, as I look around here, will be familiar with that passage where Jesus calms, peace be still. You know, we'll get it, we'll read it. Um, and most of the time when you hear a message on that particular passage, uh, for me anyway, the emphasis has been on, how Jesus calms the storm and how he's calmed the storms of our lives, right? We're, storms are going to come, but as long as we have King Jesus, <laughs> that's a song. If it's not a song, somebody should make it. It is a song. As long as we have King Jesus, um, then, you know, we know that he will calm the storm. And we look at this story, this, this passage is metaphorical for our lives and how he calms the storms of our lives. And I believe that to be true. And I believe that to be a point of this story. I just don't believe it's the main point of the story. As I, as I read it and I really delve into this passage, I don't think it's the main point of all of it. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes today about how moving when God says to move will allow him to reveal himself to you and I. Moving when God says to move will allow him to reveal himself to you and I. And if you try to stay in the same spot, I believe that the Lord would look you right in the eye and say, you can't stay here. You cannot stay here. I don't know where you've heard it. You've heard it. You don't have to go home, <laughs> but you got to get out of here. <laughs> Because we are moving. We are moving. And so we just want to talk about that for a few minutes. A lot of times we hesitate. Even, even if we feel like it's the voice of the Lord, a lot of times we hesitate. We have this spirit of, uh, are you, am I sure? Are you sure that this is what you want to do? Even if you know it's Jesus. Some of us, if you're like me, I even talk to the Lord sometimes. I have to repent. I'll be like, Jesus, now I know you God, but listen, you don't understand what's going on right now in my life, you know. And uh, yeah, exactly, David. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so he's patient. He's patient with us. So why? Why do we hesitate? Well, fear is an obvious choice, right? Sometimes we're very fearful. This author and poet, Susie Cassim, she said one time, she said, fear kills more dreams than failure ever will. Right? Fear kills more. Yeah, we, we think that it's just because we fail. But it's not. Failure doesn't kill most of our dreams. It's fear that kills most of our dreams. Another writer, uh, Steve Redhead, said it like this in a book he wrote. He got, wrote a book called Life is a Circus, and he's a Christian. He said, he said, hesitation, second thoughts, false intuition, unjustified fears, worries of failure, the list of self-created barriers is endless. Self-created barriers. So often in life, we create the barriers from us accomplishing what God has set out for us to do. Because sometimes we look around and God will tell us something and, uh, you know, this is how you know it's God. You can't do it. That's how you know it's the Lord. If you're wondering if it's God or not, if it's something you can do, it could be him or it may not be. I don't know. It all depends on your relationship, you know, with him to know if it's him or not. But if it's something you could do, you could do that already. It's kind of like, well, I didn't need you to tell me that. 
But if, it's, if, but if, 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 you, if the Lord speaks to you, you feel something in your spirit to do, and you go, there is no way in the world that I can do that or that we can do that as a church. Oh, I, that must be you then, Lord. That must be you. <laughs> because with vision comes provision. With vision comes provision. So when I contemplate this, this passage that we'll read here in just a moment and attempt to put myself in the place of the disciples, and that's really what you have to do when you read the stories of Jesus and the disciples, you really have to kind of try to put yourself in the place of the disciples. I believe that the, the main point of the whole text is overlooked. And, and that's what I want. I'm not saying that he's going to calm a storm in your life. Yes, that is a point, And that's a good point. But the main point of the text, I believe, is overlooked. So Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Look at verse 35. And, uh, you know, Jesus had preached all day. He had told parables all day. Okay. And then in verse 35, it says this. It says, on the same day. On what same day? The same day that he had preached all day and told parables all day long. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a windstorm, a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we are about to die? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. How is it that you have no faith, he's going to say to them. <laughs> he asked them this question, why are you so fearful? And they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Because right when he said, peace be still, what happened? It got quiet. It stopped. As soon as he said it, peace be still, the Bible says the, the wind stopped. It ceased. It ceased. For a little bit of context, this is, they were on what? The Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee, I believe, um, the Jordan River on the north poured into the Sea of Galilee. And then on the south, the Jordan River continued. The Sea of Galilee then dumped into it and it went north to south. And the Sea of Galilee, if you kind of study that, it's said to have... Um, been known to have storms. You know, it, it was known for storms on the Sea of Galilee, okay? And so they knew what they were getting into. They knew what they were getting into. So what I want to do, let me, let me just do something. Like I said, this is a little unorthodox. I, let me start from the end and kind of work my way backward uh, because I want to get to what I want to get to. Uh, it, they, they said in verse 41, what manner of man is this? that even the sea and the wind obey him. That's the King James Version. I like that. What manner of man is this? Who is this? <laughs> I know you like it, Brother James. King James. The Living Bible put it this way. It said they were, they were are filled with awe and said among themselves, who is this man? Now, you have to realize by this time, they had been walking with Jesus for a while. And some of them knew Jesus for quite a while. Right? This wasn't, this wasn't new. This wasn't the first time that something happened like this. Uh, in other words, a miracle. We had the wedding at Cana. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would think turning water into wine. I mean, it's a cliche to us now, but put yourself in that place. Turning water into wine, that's kind of a big deal. A man at the pool of Bethesda, been there 38 years, and people trampling over him, he can't get into the water. And Jesus comes one day, Pharisees are there, and he says, do you want to be healed? Well, well, well I, 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 I ain't asked you, I, I just answer my question. Do you want to be healed? Yes, get up, take your mat. And he got up and left. I think that's a pretty big deal. 
So it's not like they hadn't seen miracles, but for some reason now all of a sudden they're saying, what manner of man is this that the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this man? Who is this man? They had prophecy. They knew it was the Messiah. They knew it was the Messiah, right? They knew it was the one who was sent by God. But now they're asking, who is this man? Who is this man? Who is he? Uh, let, me, let me just give you kind of a point of reference. Turn, turn over to Psalm 65. Psalm 65, verses 5 to 8. And I, I'll, I'll, there's a reason I believe that they're asking, who is this man? You know, because when I look at it and I say, what are you talking about? Who is this man? You, it's Jesus. You've been with him. You've seen miracles. Why are you asking, who is this man now? Why are you asking that? I believe that there's a reason that they're asking, who is this man? It, it, it's because I, <clears throat> I believe that they understood that this was the Messiah. But did they really know what that meant? Did they really know what that meant for this to be the Messiah. I mean, he's a man because he, 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 he eats and he sleeps. He gets tired. Uh, there might have been a couple times he was cranky, right? And so he's a, I can look at He's flesh and blood. We've hugged. Uh, he's, we've walked together. He's, he's gotten tired and sat down. And I know he's also the Messiah, but I see him as a man. And so... If you look at Psalm verse 65, look at what, look at what the, the psalmist says about God. At verse 5, he says, By awesome deeds in righteousness you will answer us. Watch this now. O God of our salvation, you are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far off seas, who establishes the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, verse 7, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. See, what you have to understand is that the psalmist knew that it not, not, wasn't just a man that could speak to the sea. I, I, saw, I saw somebody perform a miracle. I saw someone cast out a demon. I saw someone turn water into wine. But now when you start talking about the sea obeys you, not obeys you, now that's reserved for the Almighty God. That's reserved for the Almighty God. Hold on a second. He spoke to the sea. Uh, this is not just water into wine now. This is not just healing a man's withered hand on the Sabbath. But he spoke to the sea. Look at Psalm 89. Flip over to Psalm 89, verses 8 and 9. See, there's a reason. There's a reason why they are amazed here. There's a reason. There's a reason. This is, this is, this is what the psalmist said in Psalm 89, verse 8. Psalm 89, verse 8. He said this, O oh Lord, God of hosts. Right there, that tells you who he's talking to. O oh Lord, God of hosts. Who is mighty like you, O oh Lord? Your faithfulness also surround us. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Now this guy, I know he's the Messiah, but he spoke to the sea and it obeyed him. Who, who, who? Wait a minute. We've been with him, but who is this man? Who is this dude? Now this is, this is a little different. We're going a little deeper. It's interesting because these verses we just read, uh, they're not only proclaiming that God controls the elements, but watch this. These are those verses that who, who is like you? No one is like you. No one. This man can't control the sea because no one is like Father God. No one is like the Almighty God. No one is like the Omnipotent One. Who is like you? Who is like you? 
There are so many other passages. Don't You don't have to write this down. But I was looking. Isaiah 50, verse 2. Nahum 1, 4. Psalms 18, 15. Psalms 104, 7. Psalms 106. All of these and more where the psalmist and the Old Testament prophets are, are saying, there's no one like you. Who is like you? You are you alone are the ancient of days. You are the only wise God. You are the almighty. You are the one, as I always say, who breathed and stars came out. No one is like you. You are the only one that controls the sea. No man can do that. But this guy, this guy spoke to the sea. Just keep that in mind. We're going to circle back to that. We're going to circle back to that in just a few minutes. You look through this, this passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. And again, we look at it and we say, yeah, it's, you know, there's storms of life that, that are going to come to us. And, you know, Jesus calms those storms. But I believe there's some other things that we need to draw out. We can't just look at a passage of Scripture and say, oh, storms are going to come. But, you know, we got Jesus, so he's going to take care of it. So no problem. Look into the passage and understand that, first of all, they, Jesus was, was, was speaking to people. He was giving, he was giving parables. And uh, they did this all day. And now the Bible says when evening had come. The first thing we need to understand about God when he calls you and, and, and how he will reveal himself to you if we allow him to do it. First thing we need to understand is his timing is not always what you would call perfect. <laughs> his timing is not always convenient. In fact, I should have wrote his timing is hardly ever convenient. This is one of those situations when I'm going, yeah, Lord, I hear you. I, I absolutely want to do that. I, I'm obeying you, Lord. It's just right now you don't understand. These kids, let me, tomorrow, um, I'll, I'll get that. Let me, let me do some stuff, and then tomorrow, because you don't know what's going on. You, you haven't had no kids like these, Lord. And God's going, yeah, right, okay. His timing is not always convenient. Why do I say that? Because in verse 35, it says, on the same day when the evening had come, he said, let us cross over to the other side. Now, listen, first of all, we already understand that the Sea of Galilee is known for storms. And also it's known for storms, especially in the evening. And who gets into a boat to go in a, on a sea that's known for storms to go all the way to the other side that they now can't see because the evening has come? Why are you saying it now? If it were me, I would say, Jesus, now listen, Jesus, you, you are, I saw what you did with that the bread, and uh, I know you know a lot of stuff. I, you're probably tired right now. You're not thinking, let's, let's get some sleep. Let's get some sleep, and in the morning, we'll be ready. And then, in the morning, weepy man, do it for a night. You know that, Lord. But joy come in the morning. So let's, in the morning, let's get up and go to the other side. But Jesus, Jesus said, no, 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 no. Let's go to the other side. Let us go now. See, we're comfortable where we are. We're comfortable. And sometimes the Lord is like, hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Let's go. And you're like, hold on a second. Where, I, I get myself. No, don't get yourself together. Why do you think Jesus did that? He, well, let me go bury my father. No, no, no. Let the dead bury the dead. We, we look at that as some harsh thing that Jesus said. But Jesus is saying, listen, when we're ready, it's time to go. We got to go. We got to go. You know what obedience is? O obedience is doing what someone tells you to do. Come on, parents. Parents know this. When they tell you to do it. Come on, mom and dad. Obedience is not just doing what I told you to do. It, I, in fact, <laughs> in fact, I think nothing gets on a parent's nerves more than a child who, when you say, clean your room, take out the trash, do the dishes, and they say, okay, I'll get to it in a minute. Let me finish this video game. What? That makes it worse. Boy, I'm, and you start saying words, and you're like, I know I'm a Christian. I know I'm a pastor. And Dietrich, I go, hey, 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 stop saying all that stuff in this house. Boy, do you know? I mean, you just, it, your mind goes somewhere else. You start saying weird stuff. Do you know what I would do? Boy, do you? 
And so it's not just about doing what the Lord says do, but it's when he says do it. Let us go. Do you have a problem understanding these words? He's the first one that said that. We think it was uh, Chris Tucker in that movie. Jesus wrote, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Let us go to the other side. I did not stutter. Let's go. Let's go. And you know, there's something interesting also that I didn't jot down here. But let me look at that scripture. It, it, they, he said, let us cross to the other side. It says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. That's, that's interesting to me. They took him along in the boat as he was. Why do you think Mark put that in there? I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really, he doesn't really go into detail about that particular sentence. But what I think, what I think it means is that, remember, what Jesus actually was, when he was preaching to the people, he was in a boat, right? In a little cove. And so the people were on the land and it made sort of this natural amphitheater as he spoke. So I believe Jesus was already in the boat, and he said, let's go to the other side, as he was. He was already in the boat. Let's go. Let's go. Don't wait. I'm not getting out this boat. I'm already in it. Let's go. Get in the boat. Come on. So his timing is not always convenient. The second thing is he calls us from what's popular. Come on, somebody. He calls us from what's popular. We, we, are in, we are in a culture, and we, we may have always been in a culture this way. We are in a culture and a, and a time that really what's popular is what's right. What, what, whatever, what's po what the most of the people think, that's what's right. That's what it is. Whatever, whatever the survey says on social media, that's what I'm going with. But Jesus calls you from what's popular to what's unpopular. It says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along. And there were other little boats with him. Also something that's never explained. There's these other little boats. And then there's no other mention of the little boats that are with him. But they were with the multitude. They were comfortable. They were tired. They were ready to go to sleep and get energized so that tomorrow they could go. They were with the people. And imagine, Jesus preached to all these people. He gave parables, his words. Imagine hearing the words of Jesus, the words of life. Imagine being there and hearing those words. So these people were rejoicing. They were satisfied in their spirits. They had a peace. And so I imagine it was great for the disciples to say, let's just stay here. The people love us. This is good fellowship. We're in the four walls. If I, if I say praise the Lord to Brother James, he's going to say praise the Lord back. I don't have to worry about being on campus or out in the street and, and somebody talking about me because of my faith. I'm amongst my people. I'm comfortable here. And Jesus says, get up out of that church. Get up out of the church and go out into the street. Let us go to the other side. He calls us from what's popular. And then it says, they took him along as he was. Sometimes, just as a side note, we tend to, even if we hear the word of the Lord, we just start moving. We don't take God with us. The Bible says they took him along as he was. The third thing we have to realize is, and this is what most people preach about, there will be resistance. When God calls you, there will be resistance. When he speaks to you to do something, there will be resistance. When you get any kind of revelation and you try to share it with someone, there will be resistance. There will be resistance. Verse 37 says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat. And they just didn't toss it. It says they beat into the boat so that it was already filling. The boat was filling up with water. And you wonder, well, I don't know why the disciples said, you know, why they had to wake him up. They, you know, they should have faith. They should have. Listen, the boat, water's coming in the boat. And they, and remember, 
what we just said. They know he's the Messiah. They've seen him do some miracles, but now we're talking about the water. We're talking about the wind. We're talking about the elements. That's God has to do that. Somebody needs to start praying to the Father because God. that's reserved for God. No one is like him. God does that. So Jesus, what is your problem, man? What is your problem? Why are you asleep? Why are you asleep? Do you not care that we're perishing? There's always going to be resistance. Don't be, don't be surprised. We always are. I am. I'm preaching it, and I still get surprised. Like, dang, why are they? Why is this happening? Why? And God just gently tells us, listen, I already told you. There's going to be, remember that? Oh, yeah, I know you did, you did, you did, you said that, you said that. Okay, I'm good now, I'm good. There's going to be resistance. Always remember that. And then the fourth thing is this. God is in it even when it seems he isn't. If he calls you, if he calls you, he's in it even when it seems he isn't. It says he was in the stern sleep on a pillow. They woke him up and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are about to die? You don't care. And then arose, he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. What happened? The wind ceased. And not only that, it says the wind ceased. Look back at, at verse 39. It says the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Not a calm. You ever seen someplace after a storm? Usually not right after there's not a calm. People are, you know, still jittery. After some storm in your life, after a mother has a baby, right after labor, she's, you know, just I need to something goes on, I need to calm down a little bit. But the Bible says as soon as he said it, the wind stopped and there was all of a sudden whew, there was a great calm. That's what Jesus does. But here's something you might not have thought about. Here's something you might not have thought about because, because we'll look at this, this last scripture here in a minute, in verse 41. You know, I, I, was, I was saying, you know, dang, Jesus, you, you know, you kind of came on a little strong when you, you said, how is it that you have no faith? You know, how is it that you have no faith? Why was Jesus, why did he come on that strong? Here's something you might not have thought about is when they said, do you not care that we are perishing? It wasn't that they were questioning his power. They knew he had the power to do something, at least pray. But they were questioning his character. Do you not care? Think about it. Think about it. I don't put myself in transparency here, but think about it. You're in a, you're in a relationship, and it doesn't matter. Marriage relationship you know, sibling relationship, family, whatever. The, the, one of the, 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 the main things that you want to know from the other person is, do you care? You know, I know you can't solve every problem. I know that. I know you can't solve every problem in my life. And I don't bring every problem to you for you to solve it. But at least I want to know that you care. At least if you say you care, I know I can make it through. That gives me strength. They came to Jesus and said, do you not even care? You imagine that? I mean, what would you think if you're Jesus? Maybe you're like me and you would think, what? After everything we have done? After every place you've been with me? You're asking me if I care? After casting out demons? After turning water into wine to save face for a family, you're asking me if I care? They're not questioning his power. They're questioning his character. Can you not get up and pray to the Father? You obviously know the Father better than we do. Can you not at least get up and pray to the Father for us? But before he even said anything to him, to them. He, uh, he, he, he's saying, I'm not going to pray to the Father. 
I'm not going to do what you think I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak to the wind and the waves. And I'm not just going to speak, please leave us alone. I'm going to speak, peace, peace, be still. And there was a great calm. And when they saw that, who, who is this dude? And so what I believe the main point of this whole story is, not just that Jesus calms storms in your life, but if you, when he says, let's go to the other side, if you will jump in the boat and go with him, he will reveal to you who he really is because you think you know Jesus. You think you know who he is, but until you get into the boat with him, until you ride out a storm with him and see what he can do. Until you get to the point where you question his character and he forgives you. You really don't know who Jesus is. You know who Jesus is uh, on, on, the, on the crucifix. You know who Jesus is on a picture. That's why we don't have pictures of Jesus around here. You know who, you know who people said Jesus was. You know who Jesus is when you read uh, you know, words in red in the Bible, but do you know who Jesus is? So I prayed today, Lord, show us yourself like you know us. Because he just, he just doesn't know us from the outside. Thank the Lord, because if that's all he looked at with me, Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Come on. Or what I do, or what I've done. If that's all he looked at, Lord, have mercy. But he knows us. We can't just know the God of uh, calming the sea. Because that's all, you'll, that's all you'll get from him. And that's all you'll want from him. Every time there's a storm in my life, I'm going to call on Jesus. But you know what he's saying? Jesus is saying, I'm giving you my spirit. I'm giving you my name. You stand up in the boat. That's why he said, what, 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 where is your... How is it that you have no faith? You stand up in the boat and you say, peace be still with faith. But you're not going to have the faith if you don't know who he is. If you don't really know who he is, you're going to be sitting there with your friends saying, who is this guy? And he's, he's, there's going to come a point where he's going to say, stop wondering who I am. Let me in your heart, let me reveal myself to you so you can stand up and say to the storm, peace be still. Because of who he is. He said to them, why are you so fearful? Have you no faith? How is it that you have? He didn't say, do you have a little bit of faith? I think this is an important point too. I don't have time to flesh that out either, but... But you can get the point. How is it that you have no faith? Come on. And I believe he said that because they're, they're, they're questioning his character. They're questioning the character of the Almighty God. And now all of a sudden they see, wait a minute, this isn't just the Messiah. I mean, it is the Messiah, but this is, but maybe my understanding of the Messiah, I, I thought it was just someone that, you know, the Lord was sending, that he, he put his spirit into, and, and, and he was going to do great things and overthrow Rome and set us up so that we rule the world. But now I'm seeing something else. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the Almighty God. This is the Ancient of Days. That's where the power in the name of Jesus comes. That's why you can believe in the name of Jesus. Because he's not just another prophet. It's not just another name. With that name is the power of the Almighty God, backed by the Word of God. When you speak the name of Jesus, and church, until we get that, we're going to be in the same place, looking at each other, saying, who is this guy? Until we understand that, we wonder in our wife life, 
And yeah, I'm transparent. I'm the same way. We, we look in the mirror sometimes and say, well, how come this didn't work? How come that didn't work? And, and I want to do just like the disciples. I want to question the character of God. Say, God, don't you care? Don't you even care? I mean, I'm, I, I did what you asked. I accepted the call of being a pastor. And, you know, I, I, I did what you asked. I took that job or, you know, married that person, whatever you told me to do, Lord. And now, look where I am. Don't you even care? But we have no revelation of who he really is. Because Jesus would say to you this morning, how is it that you have no faith? Now listen, here's what I want to here's what I want to leave you with. Because you know, if you if I just left you with how is it that you have no faith, that just that sounds like a condemnation. But I don't believe Jesus, Jesus said I didn't come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. So the encouragement is this. Well, Lord, I do have faith. I do have faith. I'm going to stop listening to my flesh. I'm going to stop listening to the enemy. And I'm going to rely on what we've been through before. I'm going to look back and see how you brought me through. And how I got to this point. And I'm going to read your word. And I'm going to spend time with you. And I'm going to get a revelation of who you really are. So that when I say, Jesus, things change. When I say Jesus, the provision is there. When I say Jesus, the situation changes. That's the encouragement for us.